Okay, just a reminder that in just a few moments here at the top of the hour, we will be starting Meet the List Maker with Elizabeth Thompson and Martha Driscoll. So, um, and actually my clock says 1 p.m. Eastern. So Elizabeth, Martha, if you're ready to roll, I will go ahead and give my introductions. Okay. All right, well, I welcome everybody to the next session of the Evergreen International Conference. This will be Meet the List Maker, presented by Elizabeth Thompson and Martha Driscoll of Noble. Um, thank you to our champion sponsors, Equinox Open Library Initiative, uh, Evergreen Community Development Initiative, and Kipu. Uh, this chat or this presentation will be recorded. Uh, I will be monitoring the chat as well. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to jump in, and I will drop the captioning link in the chat now. All right, and I'll go ahead and stop my sharing and turn it over to you. I will try to stop my sharing. <laughs> hey, there we go. Okay, over to you. And okay, uh, you should be seeing my screen. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Thompson. I'm the Member Services Manager at Noble. And I want to show you uh, something that is a uh, a tool that, that uh, Noble built um, to uh, do certain kinds of reports and things. It actually, uh, we had some scripts that Martha had written to create book lists out of um, out of data pulled from our old system. And so we started by just trying to recreate that. And then the whole thing turned into a, uh, a much larger project. Um, so we've been working uh, for this on this for years and we decided it was finally time for us to share it with the rest of the community. So um, what we're talking about is a noble custom list maker. It creates lists of items that have something in common. So show me items that are in this shelving location that have that are currently marked missing or things like that. It knows about call numbers, item attributes and circulation counts. Doesn't know anything about patrons. So it's it's not useful in, in those ways. It doesn't really know about bibliographic data. You can't say, show me books that are about uh, pu puppies that have, you know, this or that. Um, but it can provide authors and titles and publication uh, years for the attached items it finds. And you can also upload files of either items or records that you've pulled together because of things that are in those um, you know, about those uh, different topics or whatever. And then you can run that through the list maker um, and get information uh, uh, for, for books that are on a display or books that are about a particular, particular topic or whatever. Um, I'm going to stop the presentation for a minute and um, show you the list maker live. We're just going to do a couple of reports live um, so that you can see uh, what it looks like um, and how it works. So uh, this is the list maker. I'm going to start by doing a basic list. It's something I'm going to run once. We also have scheduled reports. And what I'm going to do is look for um, the Reading Public Libraries, um, all the books in their easy reader collection. So I have to find that here. No, oh, early readers. And so that's what I want. This has actually um, been a popular kind of, of project. We've had so much staff turnover. Uh, and when somebody new takes over managing a collection, uh, they often want to see what's in that collection. So they'll make a spreadsheet of the whole collection, especially if it's a relatively small area like Easy Readers. And that gives them all the information about that collection in a spreadsheet. And then they can make some decisions about, do we need to weed? Do we need to add more? What's going on with that collection? Uh, we've got lots of options here, so we could only limit this to easy readers that were added in the last year or whatever, or that have certain statistical categories, or that have certain call number prefixes or suffixes or whatever, or any of these other things. But in this case, we're not. We're just going to look for um, all of them, and we're going to make a spreadsheet. And Here's the spreadsheet. We've got some options here. We're going to leave these at the defaults. Um, when we look at the 
we can see the columns that are going to come out in our spreadsheet. Um, we can turn off some of them if we don't want them. And we can also add our own new columns. Um, one column we like to add is a link to the staff client so that when you're looking at the spreadsheet and you're wondering like, what's that book and how did that get in here or, or wanted to see more about that, you'll have a link right in the spreadsheet that will take you over to the staff client. Um, some people wanted that to be a link in a separate column and some people wanted the title itself to be a link. So we have those two um, options. And we're gonna get this in an Excel spreadsheet and we don't wanna break down those circs by who did them. And we're gonna click on there. And now we're going to enter our email address because these are all sent by email. Uh, we can give this a segment of a file name. I'm not going to do that on purpose this time. And so these are reading early readers. And like cooking shows everywhere, um, I have all of these reports already done uh, earlier today. So we can look at this. This is what people get when they, uh, when the when the system has completed the report. Uh, the first thing it does is tell us that there are 1,999 copies um, in this section and they're attached to 1,673 bibs. So some of the titles we have multiple copies of and it's telling us exactly what we, what we selected, what what uh, location and all the choices we made about what's in the spreadsheet. Um, and sometimes people are doing this primarily just to get the counts or, or things. And um, here's the spreadsheet. If we click on that, we can open that and see that. They get a kind of nicely formatted uh, spreadsheet. Um, and all the information that they asked for, the barcodes are not in scientific notation. They've been uh, changed to display as numbers. We can see information about the different, um, what's in these. This counts sheet will kind of break down that section for us by prefix and status and, and anything else that's, that's part of the, uh, the data that's, that's in the spreadsheet. Um, I mentioned that uh, we could add something uh, by by default. If you skip that line where you can add something to the to the uh, next to the um, email address, um, if you do, it comes out here. If you don't, you get a more cryptic looking thing, which is fine. The the reports work the same, but if you're going to end up with a whole bunch of spreadsheets, it's helpful if you've put some identifying information here. And this was probably the most popular thing that we did. Um, people were running these reports, but then they'd remember that like, oh, they should have done this or they forgot to include that or, or whatever. But then when they'd go back and try to redo the report, they'd, they'd make a different mistake. Um, so we have this run report with the same parameters. This is the do over link. So if they click on that, it opens the, the, this with all the things that they chose already. Um, and they can change any of those, change maybe just the email address or change any of the, the filters that are on it or whatever. And that gives them a way to, um, uh, to do it over. And the next list I want to do is a, uh, another popular one. This is a basic status change. So this is the Swapscot library. And here they have three choices. You always have three choices. They can either choose one or more specific uh, shelving locations. In the last one, we chose a single shelving location. Uh, they can choose a shelving location group, which is what we're gonna do here. We use shelving location groups to separate adult, children's and teen sections, or they could do this for the whole library. And what they're going to do is look for things where the status is missing and the status changed to missing. It's been missing since before 11, oops, 
11 months ago. And the reason that that's significant is we delete items that have been marked missing for 12 months. And so doing a report like this to find things, to be able to take to the shelf uh, and look for those things uh, gives you a last chance to, to uh, find them before they get deleted. And again, we're going to do a spreadsheet. Uh, when we do a spreadsheet for uh, things that are intended for the user to go to the shelf and look for things, we like to uh, make the list as concise as possible. At the time, you're just trying to find the thing. You don't care about the last check-in or lifetime search or whether your library is the only library that has an item attached to that. Uh, to that uh, bib record or whatever. So you, uh, and Swapskit doesn't use, oops, they don't use uh, suffixes, so we can take that off. Um, they could add anything else that they wanted that they thought was significant. Um, and And again, I already have a copy of this. I was actually, when I was doing these this morning, I was um, a little disappointed that Swampscott is uh, doing such a good job. They only have eight copies um, that are, are in, that, that, uh, in that situation of being 11 months marked missing. Um, some libraries do these reports and add other statuses. So it's like, if you're gonna go wandering around the library looking for books, you might wanna also look for um, long in transit, uh, things that are lost and paid that may have like found their way back or any other um, status that is, you know, something, something that you, that should not be on the shelf. And I, this is a very favorite of mine. I love weeding. This is a basic shelf sitter report. So we're going to be the Winthrop Library. And we're looking at adult biographies. And this is only asking you one question. How long is too long to be sitting on the shelf? So we're going to choose um, relative. And we want things that have been sitting on the shelf for five years. This is actually a kind of complex query on the on the back end. It needs to know that it needs to find items that have been in the system for five years and that um, it needs to account for the fact that some of them may have not circulated at all and uh, some may be, um, have, have different situations, but it knows about all of them. So you only have to tell them that one thing, five years or whatever the time period is. And I'm going to actually skip sending this one and go directly to the one that we have saved. Whoops. And that is this one. So we can see that they have a little over 1,800 um, items that are in the biography collection um, and have been sitting on the shelf since it, it turns this into today's, uh, to the date of five years ago. And this one does some kind of nice things. It gives them all the information about these. And it tells them um, the, the lifetime circs, the last check-in, some of these are not checked out. Some of these have never been checked out, um, but or at least they've never been checked out on a, on a noble system. Um, so this, this book was published in 1956 and maybe circulated very well, but since the time it was input into a noble system, it has not circulated. And if we scroll down, we'll find some that have um, dates that pre predate our move to Evergreen um, and even that predate our move to our last system. So in this case, this item was checked out five times, but all of those checkouts happened before 2000. And we can get information on our previous system, um, including dates, and our old, old system, uh, just the counts, uh, because of the way Martha migrated some data from our previous systems and, and it's accessible to us here. So those are three kinds of reports that are um, based on 
um, doing a search, asking the system to uh, show us some particular thing. The other kind of, of report that's uh, popular is the basic file upload. So this is, you've got a file of either items or bib records, and you have that file because you uh, maybe scanned um, all the items that are going on to um, a, a display, or you scanned items that are being moved or circulated differently for, uh, uh, for summer reading or, or some other reason. And in this case, I'm gonna be Wakefield. I'm going to say all shelving locations, and I'm going to upload a file that I have that is called bedtime books. And when you upload a file, it can be, it can contain bib records, bib record IDs, or barcodes or ISBNs. It'll use any of those types of data. And it can be a CSV file or it can be a text file. If it's a CSV file, it has to have that header row in it. Um, so in this case, it was just downloaded from, from uh, item status. And so it, uh, it's following the defaults here. And so we chose our file. If, if it didn't have the information it needed, if it said barcodes, but there weren't any barcodes uh, or any other problem, it would tell us uh, that we were unsuccessful in uploading that. And I can make a spreadsheet of these, which I'm going to do. I'm going to leave that at the defaults. But I'm also going to make a book bag slash bucket of these. And I could put a description here. I can put my evergreen creden credentials here because this is going to become a bucket that I can use like, like other buckets. And I, again, rather than actually send it to myself, I'm going to go to the copy of this that I did earlier. So here's the bedtime books. And it's, again, got the copy. I've got my spreadsheet. But I have this new thing, which is um, it's a bucket. It's giving me the bucket ID. It's a record bucket. Um, it's also giving me some some, uh, we call them book bag links. So here are the bedtime books um, presented in a, in a book bag. Book bags are very similar to what pa patrons can do in my lists. Uh, this one is sorted by author. And this is a, a, a dippy description that I put. Um, and this is a URL that can be shared with anyone put on your website, used on social media, or or, or treated like any other kind of, kind of book list thing, uh, with the added advantage that a patron looking at this can put things in the basket or place a hold directly, and they can click through to the catalog and, and so on. And these have been um, very popular. And that's what I wanted to show you live. Now I want to go back to my presentation, if I can find it. And here it is. So uh, this is kind of back to the to the file uploads. So one way to do a file upload is to scan the barcodes in item status and then download the full CSV. That's a file you can use. Um, or to go shopping in the um, in the staff client. Here I was just looking for everything uh, that that contained uh, Faith Ringgold, who, who died re recently. Uh, but I also could have been doing this um, show me books that uh, are about a particular topic, have a subject heading, have a keyword, or, or whatever. And um, again, I put them in a basket. Um, there's a nice option now in the staff client to add all your search results uh, to a basket. So, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, to a basket. Uh, then we're adding the basket to a bucket. And then we're, um, again, going to that bucket and getting the, um, the download full CSV. And that's what we're using to upload in the list maker. 
and I'll get back here to this. Um, I just wanted to show you some of the other features, the various uh, search kind of features that we have. Um, one of the options we added was to filter by deleted. Uh, so if you're looking for everything in a particular uh, shelving location or, or whatever, um, you can include active items and deleted items as well. Um, and that gives you a way to answer questions like, how many audiobook items did we add um, five years ago, as opposed to how many, presumably fewer, we're adding, um, you know, in the past year. Or which YA titles have been the most popular in the last five years, in which case we wanted to include copies that that uh, may have worn out or been lost or, or whatever, um, so that we have an accurate uh, count of, of what's been, been popular. Um, we have an option that only works for file uploads, but lets you decide whether you are only looking for physical items or all items, um, uh, physical or electronic or electronic items only. And our physical, excuse me, our electronic items don't actually have, um, are, are in the, the database. We load them in the database. They don't actually have items, uh, but it knows enough to to uh, find them based on what they do have. And in our spreadsheet, we provide um, separate sheets um, for the physical and for the electronic uh, items, different tabs. Um, we use a lot of statistical categories. Our, our libraries like to add their own statistical categories. So here we're looking at the list of statistical categories in the list maker for Phillips Academy, Phillips Andover. Uh, the ARIS age ranges and the ARIS formats is a noble level of statistical category that every library enters. But all the rest of these are individual things that, um, that Philip Sandover wanted to be able to track in some way, and they're doing that by using statistical categories. And here's an example of one of their statistical categories. They're very interested in tracking um, Andover authors, their alumni or, or, or faculty who, who wrote books and they add a statistical category in all of those. They go back to 1778 um, and they use these for various reasons. What they might be doing a um, Andover authors from the uh, 1950s, or they might be, what they're typically doing is pulling together um, authors who uh, graduated in a particular year. So this is 2024. Um, this makes it homecoming for all the, um, all the students who uh, graduated in a year that ends in four or nine, every kind of five years grouped. And so they go back and, and uh, use these. Um, circulation date, um, you can specify uh, that you want anything that circulated between this date range. So this was from last year, it was you know summer reading. Um, you can get in your spreadsheet uh, the lifetime circulations, the year-to-date circulations, or the last year fiscal year circulations, because they are item attributes. But if you want something more specific, you can uh, come and add a your own date range, and you can do the same with with due date. Um, inventory date is included here, and this is useful when you're doing something like a um, a, a report of of uh, shelf sitters um, and you're trying to include whether things have been inventoried or not or or you know we you can uh, look at the those inventory dates and um, it, it knows whether or not you want to exclude things that have no inventory date uh, we have a lot of scheduled reports basically any report you can schedule so we have the option here to run once or to schedule Schedule reports have many different options. So here we're scheduling this to run monthly on the first of the month. The and or here will give you things like the first Thursday or the last Wednesday or, or, or that. Um, we give you an option to run it now. So that if I was setting up a report that I want to run monthly on the first of the month, um, I can see a version of that report as run right now so that I can see if it's what I like and make any changes. 
Uh, we have reports that can run weekly. We have reports that can run daily. This is actually probably one of our most um, our most popular options, if they're doing something that's like a book list or they're making a carousel or one of those book bags um, using this data, um, they like to have it repeat daily so that it will be constantly updated. Um, and there's usually a relationship between the, the schedule for running them and the, the filter for for what should be included. Uh, so uh, for, for things that where they're running a report once a month on the first of the month, um, they often want to do things that were added one month ago. So this would run on May 1st and it would show us everything that was added in, in April. Um, but sometimes it's different. Uh, again, when they're trying to do something that they want constant updating, um, that they're using, we, you can make carousels out of this. Um, they, they might want it to run every day and every day add, um, include everything that's been added in the last six weeks. So every day it, it drops the things that have reached that six weeks and adds the things that were added um, the day before. Um, sometimes it's useful to use an absolute date. Um, this is um, used for situations where they are trying to spend money from a grant and they want to keep track of everything that was added during that fiscal year and watch that, whatever it is, collection grow um, and see where they, where they stand with that. So they, that's another option. Um, we do have a way for them to go back and find their scheduled reports. So there's a um, place where you can go find them. Um, here I'm looking for the Reading Library and things that the email uh, is being sent to me. Um, this is what it looks like when you find one of those things. Um, we have the option to turn it off. We don't have the option to delete these yet, uh, but we can turn it off so that, that um, it is uh, going to stop running. And we can see again everything that we did and we can click on edit to edit the scheduled report. And we can edit any element of that scheduled report. We can change the shelving locations or add things or, or delete things, change who the email is going to. Um, when we're finished making our changes, we've got two options. We can either update that scheduled report. So it will continue running, but it will now include whatever changes we, we made. Or we can schedule a new report. So in this case, if this is a, a uh, children's fiction, um, the library might want the exact same report, the exact same choices, only change the shelving location and the name to reflect that it is now, um, th that this is a new cloned version um, for the nonfiction. And we also have a quick preview. It's a report that's not a report. So all it does is it, it will um, work with those search kinds of things like show me items that have whatever or a file upload. It has a limited set of, of options. It doesn't have all the filters, uh, but it's a useful way to test out a report before running it. And it's also been a very handy way to see what's new. So if I'm uh, the, the children's librarian or whatever, and I've been out for a couple of weeks and I want to see what's new or for whatever reason, um, I can... Um, go make my selection. I only have a few options here. I don't have the spreadsheet or, or any of that. I just have um, a few basic options here and then I can generate the preview. And so this is what it's showing me. It's a layout, uh, what we call a block layout. And it looks like this. One of the options I did was to add the, the um, I guess I'm not the children's librarian here. It looks like I'm the adult librarian here. Um, and uh, you know, it's just a way to see like what's come in, or I want to bring some things to a, a presentation I'm doing, and I'm, I'm blanking on what new books were added in the last, um, you know, the last month or whatever. And we have a lot of output options. Excel is popular, particularly for the, uh, I mean, for the spreadsheet things. Um, you can break down circulation so that all the circulation fields will tell you whether that circulation happened at my library or other libraries. Um, and you can um, list branches. We have some libraries with branches. You can list them all on, on a single sheet or on separate tabs for, for each. 
Um, we have some additional sheets. We were looking at lists of items, um, but um, you can look at a list of bib records. It's all the items from the item sheet only grouped together um, on a, a sheet by bib so that it so that it adds up all the circulations. And this is useful for anything that's like the most popular books in a section so that it it already is is grouping and you can sort on on uh, on the total for the the, the number of copies. Um, author works a very similar way um, so that you can uh, do a report of your children's picture books and um, see how popular not the individual uh, Mo Willems books are, but how popular is Mo Willems in general, which the answer is very. Um, and uh, a summary sheet that, that gives the um, number of bibs and items, the median, mean, mode, date, the turnover rate, and so on. And the count sheet, which we saw, it, it will show you counts of the um, shelving locations and the statuses and everything that was included um, in your report. And this is the, what we have, have seen, this is the book bag, um, and these are very po popular. Um, the book bag, the book bag bucket option creates a staff bucket that you can see in the staff client as well as this option. And you can also use it to create a carousel. Um, and again, this is how we get the data by choosing things and downloading it. Um, with both the item bucket and the bib bucket, we can also make an item bucket this way. Um, it uh, you have options to um, add things to an existing um, bucket, um, or replace the existing bucket, or create a new bucket. Um, we also create HTML that can be added, very basic HTML that can be added to li library websites. Um, we provide some very basic CSS to make the layouts work and libraries can use that as is or they can and often do customize it to use their own. Um, we can create JSON with this. Um, and the JSON is uh, something we added because libraries wanted to use the library bookshelves um, WordPress plugin. Um, and uh, now they're using it in other ways as well. So this is a page on the Wakefield uh, website, um, new this week. And these are created using um, a string of JSON um, that is embedded in their website and is updated every day because the, uh, the contents of that are updated every day uh, because the report runs, runs daily. And uh, for using the uh, WordPress plugin, um, this is how you do it. You go in, you first of all have to have the plugin installed, of course, and when you want to add a new um, a, a new bookshelf, which is basically a carousel, you give it this information. We're using a web service. It's JSON data. Um, this is uh, the link that libraries get in the um, from the from their response, and this one's going to be run daily, and so this will update daily. And this is we have a list maker test site where people can try this out. Um, and this is um, um, a, an example of a bookshelf created using our JSON and the WordPress plugin. And that's about it. Um, and uh, Martha, are you going to tell people how they can get our code and, and, and all the technical stuff? I am. Uh, and if I can share, if you can unshare, I'll share oh, yeah. my screen. Okay, so <clears throat> we struggled for years um, to figure out the best way to share this code. There's a lot of customizations in it. Um, it's very specific to Noble, but we decided we just need to put it out there and let people look at it. So I uploaded it all to GitHub and it's it's here on GitHub, we'll send it, we'll put the URL in, in the uh, slides. 
but I'm live on the site right now. Uh, there's um, a lot of files. There's about 60 files uh, written in PHP with some JavaScript uh, that do all the different functions that you saw Elizabeth demonstrate. And I'll scroll past all the file lists to get the readme, which gives you a little bit of detail. Um, so um, we have a few little helpful hints on here um, to have a DB info file. Um, all of these PHP scripts, all of those reports go and connect to the Evergreen database and run queries that are embedded in those files. Um, so rather than putting the username and password in those files, uh, we put it in a dbinfo.php uh, where you would add your evergreen host name, evergreen port, database, database user, and password. <clears throat> um, there are a number of libraries um, that are also utilized uh, in order to do some of the functions. So the PHP spreadsheet library is what creates those spreadsheets and allows us to create tabs and do formulas and uh, format those so that the library just has to click on it, open it up, and it's the data is all there beautifully formatted. PHP Mailer is a library that lets us send the emails to the to the people who have run the um, run the reports. There's uh, the Ajax library. Um, Ajax enables us to dynamically change the content of the page. So if you saw Elizabeth choose a library, you immediately get the copy locations that are associated with that library or statistical categories that are associated with that library. <clears throat> uh, I will tell you that this Ajax library is nearly 20 years old. Uh, it works, but it's code from 2005. And Sweet Alert is, um, it's pretty alerts. Uh, JavaScript, uh, that, that green checkbox, that animated checkbox that you might've seen when Elizabeth finished configuring a report and it said it ran. Um, we maintain a custom database table within our Evergreen system. It could be anywhere, it could be in MySQL, but we put it in Postgres in the Evergreen database. We have a schema called Noble and we have one table in there and that is to manage the scheduled reports. So if a library wants to run a report, they love it, they want it to run every day, they want it to run once a week, um, and they indicate that in the form, that will get inserted. The data necessary to run that will get inserted into the table. <clears throat> and then a cron job will come around every day and check to see if there's uh, a report to be run that day, and it will do so. Um, there at the end of this readme here on GitHub uh, is a list of all the all the files and what they do. Um, there are a number of customizations in here. Um, you know, we we ideally wanted to kind of simplify this and and make it available that anybody could download it and run it. Um, there are a number of noble customizations in here. Um, Things like some of the statistical categories are hard coded in there. Uh, the date ranges, you know, we know when we went to Evergreen, we know how far back our circulation data goes, and that's kind of hard coded in there as well. And some of that is called out on this uh, list of files. Um, but we're offering it to you to look at, um, you know, see if we can share this this code and and get some ideas churning. Um, I think it's really. It's it's been a hugely popular program in our network because you can just basically walk up to a screen, click a few buttons. You know, libraries know their data; they don't know what table it's in in the back end, but they certainly know what they're looking for, and this enables them to use a familiar interface, click some boxes, and get a really nice report. And I guess we can move on to questions. I did not see any questions uh, in the chat, but just for our participants, um, you can either type your questions in the chat or you all should be able to unmute yourself and ask directly if you would like. Uh, 
Uh, we have a question from uh, Bradley in the main feed loop interface that says, how long do you find it takes larger reports to generate? Uh, I've run some really big ones and it can take <clears throat> a while. So like all the, um, you know, all the music books in the entire database or whatever category, whatever call number range, half an hour, yeah, it, it, that's gonna depend on your system, your processing speed. For typical reports, Elizabeth, that you run, I mean, they're sort of instant. They're, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how complex the report is and how um, large the, the number of records it has to go look at. So if you're trying to look at a library's entire nonfiction collection and it's a sizable library, that's gonna take a while, it might take, couple of hours, depending on how, how complex it is. Um, the um, We had a lot of experience with this during COVID. Uh, when libraries shut down, um, one of the things that a lot of libraries did was um, make make reports from, from home. And um, when at the at the time that libraries were mostly closed, but a couple of staff people were going in, you know, twice a week and staying apart from each other or whatever, uh, people were doing a ton of weeding. So they were doing a weeding report, a shelf set of report, and then they were, they were going to the shelves and they were doing so many of them. And we have some very large libraries, one academic library there that, you know, was doing their, their, their stacks and, um, you know, and that got into hours and hours, um, so much so they thought they killed it. Um, but, uh, you know, they learned to separate that. I didn't show call number ranges, but you can certainly do a call number range within a large uh, section and they switched to doing to doing that. Um, the, the other thing I, I, I I talked about uploading those those files, the the bedtime files, and 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 that kind of stuff. Um, a, another great use for that is to do a file with everything in the database that has the word autism in a subject heading or or something like that, um, and uh, then libraries can run that individually uh, when they upload that file. They're saying only show me these if they're in Reading's nonfiction or in Reading's fiction or or whatever, so that they can um, one the same file can be uploaded um, by many different libraries with many different um, permutations and and get information that they that they're looking for. There I see a, a question. Sorry, oh, go ahead, sorry. Andrea. Nope, it's all you. You got it. <laughs> well, I was just, I saw a question in chat from Catherine. Do you find most of your libraries use this in place of the reporter? Um, <laughs> there are things that the reporter uh, does that this doesn't do at all. Um, and, you know, anything having to do with patrons or, or those kinds of things. But, but yes, for anything that this is capable of doing, um, uh, this is what, what people use. Um, I do frequent training sessions on this, training sessions um, in different ways. There's one I do uh, in December that's um, how to find the most popular books in your library and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, for the, for the year is best. Um, and for, uh, uh, we, we have added some things. We've added um, options for course reserves and acquisitions, which we didn't originally have. And the acquisitions reports don't do every kind of report you would need in acquisitions, but they do a lot of the basic ones and stuff. So, so yeah, it's been, it's been very popular. And, and uh, all those things I showed, like, like including books that have been deleted or including, you know, the electronic resources or, or other kinds of things. Those were all the direct result of somebody was trying to do a report with something and, and said, you know, every time we show a new version or show it to new people, they're like, that is so awesome. Could it also show you this thing or that thing? And, and uh, you know, that's how it's really grown. Um, Martha, I'll ask that you get to the circ filters, including aged. Uh, for the circ, for the circ filters, is it including aged circs? I believe so. Um, I think we always, and I, I'd have to double check that, but almost all the 
Postgres queries we write, we always look at the age circulation table um, because that's where all the circs are going to end up eventually. Um, we do age us circs after a month, maybe six weeks, I forget. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely look at the age circulation table. Uh, what does the deployment look like on a brick or completely separate web server? Um, yeah, I have it running on a, a cloud server that, that I have, um, and it has to talk to the Evergreen database, obviously, to get its data. Uh, and as long as you enable access to the Evergreen server from wherever you want to run it, it could run on a utility server, it can run on something you've got running in-house, it can run on a Amazon web something, Google Cloud server that you spin up, uh, as long as it can talk to the database. Uh, and, yeah, publicly accessible with no logins. Um, yeah, we we don't have, that's a good question. We don't have any limited access of it other than, do we, Elizabeth? I it's, don't... it's a, it, it's not it's not available outside Noble. That's kind of one of the reasons we're we're talking about about doing this. Um, within Noble, um, this is things we probably should think about. Uh, anybody can run any kind of report. Um, we have no ownership um, of those reports. So I could go in or somebody from one library could go in and accidentally or weirdly on purpose edit a re scheduled report that belo re belongs to a, another library. Um, libraries can and do sometimes compare themselves to a peer institution to see who has more books on a particular topic, or or, or those those sorts of things, um, but it it um, you know, and we we've just never taken the time to add that sort of um, you know that sort of control. But but yeah, it's not. I don't think it's available outside of Noble. Yeah, it's accessed through our staff system. Thank you so much for uh, sharing the code. That's very cool um, for everyone to to play for it themselves. Um, noting your caveats about there's there's customizations in there. Do you plan to put this out um, like as potentially a candidate for for inclusion in Evergreen proper? And I'm sorry if you said that and I missed it. I'm like doing mod things and <laughs> I've got too um, many fires right now. <laughs> I mean, I I didn't say that, but that would certainly be a goal that it uh -huh. be some kind of embedded in evergreen or yeah. so adopted or, by the community or inspire different you know ideas or or, or whatever uh, frankly we've talked for you know years now about about uh, sharing it and we did fall into the the trap of like but it's not perfect and i need to fix it up and we need to you know be able to have all the answers to all of our questions and we need to get all the customized stuff out of there and then finally we decided that perhaps we would offer it as is, and and uh, you know, see what what happens what happens with it. Yeah, that's great, and thank you for that's very generous. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be excited about tinkering with this. <laughs> well, it's it's not generous. We're we're hoping that it benefits us because more people will be working on it one way or another, and and uh, um, you know that it uh, it won't be our secret little thing um you know it, it it'll be incorporated in one sense or, or another to, with what people are doing we have uh one minute left on the schedule are there any final thoughts or questions um for elizabeth and martha making sure I look at all the chat windows here. All right. Yeah, I see Jennifer's uh, comment about being easier for staff to use. They, they love it and are very imaginative about, about what they do with it and, and how they're using it.
All right. Well, thank you both so much. This was uh, really informative. I think you've got a lot of people interested in playing with your tool and um, fixing, helping, helping you guys maintain it and maybe getting it into evergreen popper. That would be very, very exciting. So thank you both.